I thought I'd get some acknowledgements out of the way first, because at the end of the day I'm not presenting anything, uh, or very little actually, that AGT's put together. This is all, all other people's work. So I guess first most uh, definitely the GRDC, and, and that means ultimately the farmers and the federal government for funding the NVT system that provides the independent data that we're going to talk about today. And here comes Neil, someone who helps look after the NVT system. SARDI, both their field crop, excuse me, <coughs> evaluation and pathology uh, groups. So I've used a bit of um, disease data, uh, resistance data from Hugh as well. And also the growers who uh, allow these trials to happen on their properties. And lastly, I've just pulled a little bit of sprouting data from a, SCA, a SAGIT project. I'm going to talk about the 2011 NVT wheat trials, just give a little bit of an overview as to uh, what happened. Then give a really brief bit of background to a series of new varieties that have been released. Um, I'm not going to give a lot of information, I think it's more about a bit of a heads up, they're around, have a look at them, keep your eye on them and have a look at the data that's out there. Then try and dissect some of the longer term performance in terms of profitability versus productivity and then have a bit of a chat about how we give you good predictors of on-farm performance into the future. So what happened in 2011? Feel free to call out and disagree if there's someone in the crowd especially who was involved in um, putting these trials together. Um, my understanding is there was only one failure in wheat, so I reckon that's pretty impressive, and 25 successes. And uh, listening to the talk previously um, on barley, I think the yields are pretty similar, maybe just a touch high with wheat, but that's to be expected, right? So, Jason? Um, I think the lowest was at Wombi for us, so it was the lowest was streaky for them. Other than that, the top yielder was down at Cummins, an unbelievable trial. Who got to see that trial? Anyone get down and see that one? That was unbelievable, wasn't it? That was, that was a, everything was up here, especially Barley Max. That one was right up here somewhere. Um, but in addition to that, the grain quality was uh, fantastic. Compare that to 2010, where we had low protein problems, I think, both on farm and in trials generally, not enough nitrogen. This year, uh, people put a bit more nitrogen on. Uh, so even with the high yields, we had good, good protein, but also test weight and screenings were very, very, very good. I guess just a quick comment on disease control. In the past, in NVT trials, one of the criticisms that I think you as a group have had is that the diseases were not controlled like they would be on a farm, and so the yield data, next door to meaningless. Uh, but now we've actually moved to the point where stripe rust was very well controlled in all of the South Australian trials. Uh, at the moment there's a review going on, I'm not certain whether it's been completed yet or not, looking at how the GRDC will ask NVT operators to look after trials for other diseases like leaf rust, stem rust, yellow spot over in the west for example, maybe Staganospora and Adorum. So that's ongoing and um, so I guess just watch this space. One, one uh, impact of that was, for example, the Miniper trial got smashed with leaf rust this year and it, was sprayed, well, it wasn't able to be sprayed timely. <coughs> a few other issues that were noted. Uh, you've heard a bit about the white grain that Hugh's been sending um, updates about. He was able to sample some grain from the Bullaroo trial. There wasn't enough at the Kimber trial, but he got some from the Bullaroo NVT and he also got some from the AGT trial and had a look at the level of white grain in varieties, trying to work out if there was any... Um, varietal differences and basically the message he wanted to put forward today was no, there's no consistent message about any differences between varieties. So at least for now, variety selection is not a way to manage the botrysfera. Did I say that right? Big long word starts with B, ends in fera. Um, yeah, that one's, so there's no genetic way of dealing with that at the moment. <coughs> so in 2011, sprouting was less of an issue but black point was a bit more of an issue. So we, we still had a bit of a receivable um, issue going on through trials and also out, I guess, feedback from growers as well. One other thing that we need to be aware of was that there's been a change to the leaf rust pathotype that's been floating around South Australia. In the past, wild catchment was highly resistant and now uh, Hughes revised that rating down to MS. And that's affected other varieties with wild catchment background, uh, more notably Wallop, for example, one of the newer ones, and also Korak. That's, they've both gone down from MR to R down to more of an MS or maybe even MS to S rating. Um, Mace has dropped from about R down to MR, so not, not so bad. So something to keep a bit of an eye on. We don't have a lot of data, but it's something to keep your eye on over the next year. And one other last, one, just one last point, I guess, is um, this last one. Yellow's on the YP. Is, is Akko here at all? Or someone from down that way? Yeah, we, we, had, um, we had some problems, didn't we, about uh, a few, I think there was Yellow's in... in um, was it Justica mostly or Gladius? And Coral as well. And Coral as well, yeah. 
And so we, we know about this yellows issue that we've been getting in that, in that RAC875 derivative family. But I think this year what we saw really quite severe versions of the yellows. And um, quite often though, I think what was actually happening was it, was it was leaf rust infection and it was a hypersensitive reaction to that leaf rust infection. And where we had plus and minus fungicide plots, the yellows weren't even there. So I guess just to confuse the whole yellow story even more, I think mostly what people were seeing last year was actually early leaf rust infection, not the physiological yellows that we've been seeing over the last few years. Like, that's pretty much where we got to, wasn't it? I'm not going to focus much on the 2011 results because it's just one year, okay? Um, we'll move on to the longer term predictions of yield and spend a bit more time on them. But I think it's worth just noting the top five um, for each region. We've got... Um, I guess the, the thing to note here is, if I'm not in the way of these people over here, we've got you know, Mason Scout, for example, some of the varieties that I guess are, are really up and coming varieties at the moment that did, uh, did really well again last year. Um, that's probably the first message there. And the other thing I think, which I'm, I'm going to go th through some of these varieties, is some of these newer ones. We've got Emu Rock, for example, that's come out of uh, Intergrain. Uh, we've got Korak that's coming out of AGT, and also Cobra coming out of um, Longreach. Uh, these are new varieties that are now available and also they featured fairly prominently in the top five. So I think that's sort of quite interesting to note that some of these newer varieties are, are really giving some of these leaders a bit of a, uh, a, bit of a run. Um, and also some of the more standard, you know, the, the one, some of these key varieties that we all know have performed well in the past are still featuring near the top. So 2010 data was a little unique. We had a really high yield and a very soft finish. 2011, it seemed to me, has really lined up quite well with what we've expected because we had a bit of a dry patch happening in uh, August, early September, and I think it really reflected a little bit more the long-term yield performance that we've seen for some of these varieties. So, some recent releases. I'm just going to flick through these, all right? And at the end, I think um, there should be time, hopefully, for some questions, if you've got any more questions on these. They're in alphabetical order, so as to not prioritise anything over the top of anything else. Um, here's Cobra. This has uh, been released initially for Western Australia by Longreach and was included in the Air Peninsula, both lower and upper, in the 2011 MVT trials, but not the rest of the state. But for 2012, it will be included across the whole region. It's a Westonia derivative and has got some of those sort of features. Reasonably short, but uh, vigour more similar to Westonia, unlike you know, the lower vigour of Wild Catchem, uh, early mid-maturity. Currently APW in South Australia and um, as with a lot of varieties when they first come out, that sort of final classification is still being sorted out. Yellow spot, similar to Wild Catchem, so that's a, a good strength. Uh, rust resistance, good on the stem, fairly marginal on the stripe and leaf rust, um, better than Wild Catchem but not brilliant on the powdery mildew, but not a huge issue at that rating, quite a long way away from the Wild Catchem. So I think Cobra is one to keep your eye on. Um, it did quite well also over in the uh, West Australian NVT last year. Corax one uh, that's come out of AGT. It's a CCN resistant wild catchum derivative. It's early maturity with increased vigour over wild catchum as well. Um, but currently, probably the biggest drawback at the moment is it's currently ASW in South Australia, um, but we'll be seeking an upgrade for this year as well. So again, as with a lot of these newer varieties, just keep an eye on that classification. Yellow leaf spot, similar to wild catchum. Again, like Cobra, uh, good for stem rust, but marginal for stripe and leaf. And I think it is important to point out, especially for those growers on the lower air peninsula where wild catchem, as far as I'm aware, powdery mildew is now the number one disease because of wild catchem, um, Corac is, is actually worse than wild catchem for powdery mildew. So I think that's something to bear in mind as well. Emu Rock, uh, released by Intergrain, uh, early, to, early maturity for mid to late sowing. Pick that up out of the fact sheet, so that better be correct. Uh, this is a cookery derivative. Uh, the other half of the pedigree is complex West Australian uh, pedigrees. They're always fun to dissect. Um, yellow spot's reasonable, not, a, not quite as good as Wild Catchem. Um, CCN is S, uh, but it, I guess its main feature is that AH classification um, and also the fact that it has a fairly robust rust package there. MR, uh, MRMS for stem, MRMS for stripe. MS to S for leaf, so not great, but, um, but not, a, not, not a complete sucker. And powdery mildew, actually very similar to Cobra. Okay, moving somewhere completely differently. Now we're, we're moving into forest. This is uh, a wheat released by HRZ that stands for High Rainfall Zone. This is actually bred out of New Zealand, so you can sort of imagine the sort of wheat this is. Uh, this is focused more at the southeast, 
and they've said it's a longer season wheat for early sowing in high rainfall districts. So really focusing in on that environment. It's got an APW classification, good black point, which is important for that environment. The, I guess its feature again for that environment is that it has excellent rust resistance, MR to R for stem and stripe and MR for leaf. So I think, um, and pretty good yellow leaf spot too. So I guess for those people, um, trying to look around, for people who are advising clients in the southeast, I think worth having a look at this one. It hasn't done well in trials in the NVT southeast because we're talking uh, sites such as, um, we're talking Sherwood, Keith, and also uh, Wolseley, we're not talking right down into the Francis type area where we're really talking about this sort of wheat having its home into the Millicent type environment, all that sort of thing, or maybe on the lower Flurio or something like that. So I think you'll need to be looking at other trial sets. Is, is Trent around? Or anyone from that group? No, I just know they run some other trials down there, so it'd be worth talking to those guys about how well it's performed in that environment. Okay, so Wallop. You'll notice there's a bit of wild catchment floating around through these pedigrees. It's not surprising. Wild catchment was a good week. We've got the breeder of wild catchment here too, sitting in the room, by the way. So you can either go up and congratulate him or be upset, one or the other. Um, early the mid-season wheat uh, released by AGT. Although it's early the mid, it really is better suited to the mid to high rainfall growing environments. The other half of its pedigree is Cara. So it's picked up a bit of that sort of adaptation really been released more for the Wimmera and the southeast of New South Wales and into the western districts of Victoria, but I think could potentially have a place in the mid-north and maybe the southeast of South Australia as well. Uh, CCN resistant, AH classification in South Australia, yellow spots not quite as good as wild catching but fairly good, and it's rust resistance, MR to R for stem, MRMS for stripe, and MS for leaf rust. Oh, and S for powder mildew. So, yeah, so that's one more for the, even though it's got wild catching, it is more for that mid to high type environment. Okay, I'm just going to lump all the clear fields together. Who's growing a clear field, a clear field plus wheat this year? How many people have got clients growing those? Yeah. Is there any feedback on that sort of thing? Call it out. They're doing all right? Did, yeah, only APW, okay, so that's a problem. Any other issues with, I guess, really Cord and Justica are the two out there at the moment? Some of the grain samples weren't that great. Yeah, what, what was the problem? Uh, the problem was uh, some of the grain samples weren't great? Justica, I think, was the main one. Uh, test weight on Justica, or what was the problem? Uh, yeah, it was a bit low. Yeah, yeah, so that is one of the main problems with Justica. It's test weight, not as bad as Coral, but not as good as Gladius. So it's right at that lower end. So that is a problem with Justica. Um, I guess I've listed a couple more up there. So Justica and Cord are the two that are out there. Um, Robin, do you want to quickly just clarify and pose? It's been released in WA, uh, been, been pulled out of South Australian trials. So what's Intergrain's plan for that? Uh, because it's similar to MACE in terms of being susceptible to BS or uh, strike rust, we're not actively promoting it in, in South Australia. Um, obviously, in Western Australia, that like most, that resistance is still fully affected, so that's the reason for the WA focus. Okay, so for those who didn't hear, basically it's, it's not being promoted in South Australia because it has poor stripe rust resistance, but in WA that's not an issue because the resistance is still effective. I'll just uh, uh, I'll make a quick comment there that it has very large grain, so that you need to account for that in the seed, seeding rate of that, um, of that variety, and certainly <coughs> some of the trials have been less than optimal seed damage. Okay, Rob's just pulling up another point that if um, you heard the talk earlier from Bali, there was also talk about the fact that we need to be cognizant of adjusting our sowing rates according to grain size, and I think that goes for a whole heap of varieties. Um, the other one is Elmore. This is one that's just been released by AGT. This is a uh, annuello background, um, more of a Victorian southern New South Wales focus, I guess with that annuello jant sort of pedigree. Uh, however, it may have a place again in the mid-north, the southeast environments where Jants and Annuello were given a crack in the past. Um, unlike Annuello, it's not CCN resistant, so it is CCN susceptible. I guess the feature of this over the others is that it's the only currently available AH Clearfield Plus variety, currently, I should say. So, but that, so that's just, I guess, a feature if you're looking for that uh, performance and adaptation similar to Annuello and Jants, as you'd probably expect. I guess I've just got a photo there. I always like putting this photo up because it just shows you that if you spray Intervix on something that doesn't have genes for resistance, it dies. Um, it's, 
Now, we, when we talk yields, we go, yeah, it's like 5% higher yielding. But it's really good when you look at this data because it's like an infinitely higher yielding. It's just exciting. Um, so thinking about changing careers into herbicide work because it's more exciting. OK, can't leave Durham out. I was going to, but Robbie said, no, nah, you've got to leave Durham in. It's important. So I said, oh, all right, OK, then. But with the prices last year, hey, well, I couldn't, you couldn't be upset with Durham, could you? All right, new variety from Uni of Adelaide. I think most of you are aware of um, Tujilkuri, uh, Chukuri, all right. Uh, grain yield, very similar to Hyperno and Saintly, quality similar to Hyperno. So if we ever look down here, I've just pulled out the data. This is the long-term performance from the Mid-North and the York Peninsula. Yeah, I mean, Hyperno, Saintly and Chukuri are all quite a step up from Tamaroy and Kalka. Uh, rust resistance is slightly varied, but to be honest, there's not a big risk there on any of those rusts for any of the varieties. So, you know, I think it's, you know, pretty much take your pick. Like I said, grain size, um, similar to Hyperno, and, and for both of these then, um, screenings can be a bit of an issue. So it's something to be aware of, I think, on these newer durums. One of the things that they've done by, you know, big jump in yield, fantastic. A lot of the way that that's been achieved is through increasing the number of grains per square metre. And that's come at a cost to grain size, because they're often negatively correlated. So I think that's just something to be aware of with some of these new durums coming through, that you need to manage the variety accordingly. But great for competitiveness, certainly more robust, especially when you get into the drier environment, some of these new varieties compared to the old durums, which is what we've all been looking for, of course. OK, so profitability versus productivity. We often focus on the yield, but I thought it'd be interesting to pull in uh, more than just that. First off, on the yield, this is the long-term yield analysis. Jeez, I got Richard in the eye with a laser pointer then, sorry mate. Um, lower Air Peninsula, really if you look through this whole thing, we've got Scout and Mace that just sort of, just fight each other off of the top two positions most of the way through here, and really not a whole lot in it, depending on the environment. Um, I've taken the top five for the lines that were, or the top uh, ten, sorry, that are still in the trials or something along those lines, so really these, you can throw a blanket over those two and then there's usually only a couple of percent below them to the next suite of varieties. I guess... Um, in these you're noticing, for example, wa uh, Wallop, Korak, Cobra, all featuring in the upper. Um, Korak, and then I think Cobra's in here somewhere, again in the lower air peninsula. So they're, they're coming up quite well in those environments. York Peninsula, Murray Mallee, South East. Look, I think one thing that you'll notice here, and I want to come back to this, is that there's not a whole lot of difference between these regions. You notice the same varieties came up regardless of where we were. Same two, same three in the top position, really. A little bit of variation, but the rankings are fairly similar. But that's not what we actually experience in the real world. These varieties don't always perform the same way in the same environment the whole time. And I think that this is my criticism of how we're going about uh, analysing and presenting data on NVT trials. And I think hopefully we can touch on that if we've got a few minutes at the end, about how we might be able to do this better into the future. Again, all of this data is publicly available. Neil, this is all up on the website now. Yep, so you know you can look at this yourself. We won't, go, won't sit here for too long looking at it. OK, what happens if we do lay profitability over the top? So some of the things I went through, I went and uh, well, weren't considered. So I've looked at some things that impact on profitability, but not everything. First off, I went through and went and looked at all of the varieties and said, what's their classification? But you can't just take an AH classification and go, oh, AH is worth 40 bucks a tonne more than APW, therefore I'll just multiply $40 over the top of the yield and that's my benefit. Well, it's not, because how often do you get AH on an AH variety? Not every time. So we need to take into, ac into account all the other features that are impacting on the likelihood of a variety making it into a particular grade. So I guess the point here is classification and grade are not the same thing. So we took into account what's their classification and then said, what's their grade that they actually would have fallen into? So this is every variety from every site in the NVT. What was the grade achieved in 2010 and 11? And then we took the, I've taken the average of that as sort of like a long-term predictor. It was the best I could do with the data at the moment. Did that based on the classification, the protein it had, the test weight, and its screenings performance at that site. What I didn't take into account, because I don't have the data, is the falling number and the black point for the variety. So clearly that's a big hole when you consider 2010 and 11. So I put that out the front. I have not taken that into account. Tried to come up with a way of doing it, but I haven't done it yet. Took into account the, fung the likely fungicide use on average going forward and said, for leaf, stem and stripe rust, 
how much money do we spend putting out fungicides on each of these varieties in dry and wet zones? So I said a dry zone, for example, was the Upper Air Peninsula and the Murray Mallee, and everything else was wet. So for an example, I think I said that a variety like mace, which is highly susceptible to stripe rust, would take on average two and a half fungicide applications in a wet environment and one and a half in a dry. You could argue if it's half different than that, but I think roughly those numbers will work. I didn't take into account any other diseases like CCN and yellow leaf spot, which do feature fairly prominently when you're picking a variety. Okay, so admittedly, there's a fair few problems here. But let's put it up. Oh, sorry. Then I cascaded that across the long-term yield results for each region. And this is what I came up with. Squiggly lines. Okay, we've got, uh, and the varieties I've picked, I couldn't fit everything up here, was basically anything whoops, that's been in um, production for two years, uh, or widely grown. Okay, so I haven't got Korak, Cobra, Emu Rock, those new things up there. I've just left it the things that are in production, basically. And then split it for each variety into the zone. Okay, sorry if I'm in the way there, I'll come back. Okay, so I think the first, if I can just point out a couple of things that this message that came through to me was, here's Gladius, for example, okay? I'll pick on it, AH variety, widely grown. Let's compare that to a very closely related sister line Asparta. This is largely the impact, because they yield fairly similarly, long-term mets. This is largely the impact of APW to AH. There's a little bit of a poorer receival standards on Asparta, probably just a little bit higher screenings, a little bit lower test weight, but in reality, they're very, very similar. So that's the impact of moving from APW to AH on on-farm profitability, taking a relative return compared to the average of all varieties. So in other words, Gladius on average is about, what, $40 a tonne better than the average of all the other varieties across the regions, compared to a Sparta that's a bit below 20. So there's about a $20 a tonne, sorry, $20 a hectare difference between those. But if we go down into the actual environments themselves, let's pick the mid-north, for example. Mid-north, look at this. It's a big number up there. What is that? $75 down to negative 21. So we've got nearly $100 a hectare difference between a Sparta and Gladius in the mid-north over the last two years which is pretty big, and I think what's being driven there, if you look across all the varieties, and we'll look at this, we've got a high number for, geez, my hands shake, um, for AH varieties, and we ended up with a lower number for APW, Scout, uh, STOC, where's this, um, and Asparta, for example, and got another one. Oh, Catalina didn't do so well, but anyway, the APWs generally have done poorer in that mid-north environment. So I think in that environment, particularly in 2010, it was the environment where they, we actually were more likely to achieve the protein to get into hard. So therefore, being hard was very valuable. But in some of these other environments, maybe in the Murray Mallee, for example, there was less of an impact in 2010 because generally the proteins were all low. A lot of trials coming out of the Murray Mallee only had 7, 8, 9% protein. They were underfed. So having AH really didn't do much for you. So I guess my point there was that a lot of the values or the characteristics we consider about varieties and we say there's regional adaptation for yield, I think there's regional adaptation for quality characteristics as well that we need to really be considering when we're trying to pick varieties. Some of the, five minutes, all right. Some of the other things to look at, for example, here's Mace and Scout, the two sort of up and coming varieties. If we compare these to Gladius, they're actually behind, however, <clears throat> what we haven't taken into account, obviously, on Gladius is its sprouting susceptibility. So that was best case scenario. In reality, there are a lot of times it did not make AH because it actually shot. Okay, so I'm not suggesting that is the actual number. And it'd be really good, I think, to have a, a good risk profile for the different sprouting levels to be able to cascade over the top of this for growers, for good decision making. Okay, what happens if we shift our receival standard from 74 to 76 for just for some key varieties that are affected? I picked two wild catch and yippee that don't seem to have a problem with test weight and two that do, coral and gladius. If we shift it from 74 to 76, the return on coral will drop on average across all regions from what, 795 down to 765, something like that. That's what the impact would be over the last couple of years. Just put an if up there, because um, the last thing I just heard was in the, uh, a recent meeting, there's been more conjecture about whether this shift should actually happen or not. So as much as it's on the website at the moment for GTA saying it will happen, apparently that's actually up in the air still. So there's still a little bit of an unknown there. For varieties like Wild Catchman and Yip Pea, there's still a reduction. And when you look across the whole, I've got the average here, this is going to affect returns for growers. That's real, that's, that's loss in income, doesn't matter what you grow. 
All right, what happens if you change the price of putting out a fungicide? What does it cost? Does it, I reckon if I ask this question, I'm going to get a lot of different answers. What does it cost to put out a fungicide? $5 a hectare? $20 a hectare? Pretty depends on whether you like putting fungicides out or not. Um, if you vary that number, obviously the slope of these lines changes. So if we take something like Axe, which is highly rust resistant, no impact because we don't have to put rust out. Take Mace, on the other hand, highly susceptible. You know, its profitability drops off. This is the southeast, just as an example. It profitability drops right off when you get down to this $20. But up at $5, it's quite competitive in the southeast. Right. So I guess just having a good handle on these costs and the interaction with the features of the variety is pretty important. All right, so I've got a couple more slides, Richard. Hopefully I can flick through them. So it comes back to, I guess, the question for all of this sort of data, and I think it's one that we often forget when we're running trials. We, we run trials and we see them as a discrete experiment. And we say, fantastic result. Such and such yielded more than such and such. But that bit of information is actually pretty useless unless we consider why we're actually doing it. The yield data ultimately, I mean this is pretty a bit of a motherhood statement, yield data from trials is used to pick the best variety for farmers to grow. Yeah, okay, we all know that. But what that actually means is that we're using historical trial data to predict future farm performance. This is actually pretty much pulled out of a lecture that I received when I was in undergrad. So historical trial data to predict future farm performance. So really, if our history is not a good a predictor of the future, then our trial data is useless. All right? So it means that the data we're using must reflect the future or else there's no point in doing it. So that says something about the amount of data we have. How do we make sure that our predictions are as accurate as possible? Well, first off, we have to use as much data as we possibly can. When you see predictions put up for a variety that's only been included in a trial series for one year, maybe even two, treat that data with a great degree of caution. I don't believe 2010 and 11 are good predictors of the future going forward forever, right? Five or six years, sure. However, we're stuck at that point. We often only have one or two years of data. So what do we do? Well, we stick more of environments in there. We don't limit ourselves to our current federal boundaries, South Australia, WA, South Austra uh, Victoria. When years are limited, as is almost always the case, we can use widely dispersed environments, for example, WA, SA, Victoria, Mallee, Southwest New South Wales, as a surrogate for years. These are all environments that are highly positively correlated with one another. And that's what happens if we do it. I've just taken some, a w, uh, an AGT analysis. Ignore the detail, it's just the concept. In the NVT system, the analysis is problematic because it's a huge data set, but they're moving toward this sort of analysis where we look at what is the relationship between every environment with every other environment. From that, we get a picture of clusters that are forming. This cluster up here is basically entirely Western Australia for 2011 and 2009 and a little bit of 2010, but 2010 in WA was an unusual year. Then we've got some other clusters. This is a really soft SA Victoria environment. This one's a medium sort of finish to the environment. And this one here was a really tough environment. And the interesting thing here is, one of these lines here is Bullaroo in 2011, and one of these others down here is actually Mintero in 2011, and they're negatively correlated with one another. And in the NVT system, they get lumped together in the mid-north prediction. That's why all the varieties look the same. If we actually then look at how the varieties perform in these clusters, I think we get a much more meaningful picture of how the varieties perform. Again, I'm not trying to focus on the detail here, but more the concept. That we can look at these clusters and say, well, in a tough finish, and a tough finish could happen at Mintero, it could happen in the southeast, but it's more likely to happen at Minipa or it's more likely to happen at Wombi. This would be the ranking of the varieties. But if we move to a soft finish, which is more likely to happen in the southeast, but in 2010 it happened pretty much everywhere, then this is the ranking of the varieties. And if we look at a couple, where's Axe? I mean, it's the most extreme. Tough environment, soft environment. All right, we all know that's what happens to Axe. Take something like Wild Catchem, fairly flat. Take Scout, it responds to the good environment. And we've seen it perform really well in 2010 and 11 because of that. So I think, for me at least, then, that data combined with the means for an environment give you not just a picture of the long-term performance for yield, but also the variability around the performance and the risk associated with growing a variety. OK, so I guess I'd just like to leave you with, that's my thoughts, but what would you like to see? Can we continue this conversation? What sort of data do you want to see so that you can advise your clients what varieties to be growing? Thank you. One of the things that I had, Hayden, I wrote down when you were talking about the germs and, and the different levels of screenings, 
do you think the, uh, the seeding rates should be reduced at the durum, like traditionally when we started out growing durums, you know, 15, 20 years ago we were sowing at 120, 130 kilos per hectare. Do you think reducing the seeding rates of durums will help with the screening issues and some of the varieties like, like Perno, et cetera? Uh, yeah, so sowing rate, obviously the impact of that's going to be you know, highly impacted by the soil that you're doing the experiment on or the year that you're doing it in. I think the comment I'd make is, I think the durum is becoming more like wheat, so you treat it more like you'd treat wheat. I think that's my first thought on it. But I think the other thought is, I don't think we really know. And I think we need to be looking at what is the best agronomy for these newer durums, which are a very different variety than the old durum. So I don't really know. I think that's a simple answer, but I think we should find out because... Um, it is clearly going to require a different growing practice than the new germs, I think. Hey, is uh, Wallop A in Victoria? Uh, the question was, is Wallop A H in Victoria? Because you'll notice we've got Victorians that crept over the border. We let them in. And there's even a West Australian in the crowd, I can see. Um, yeah, the, the answer is yes, it is A-H in Victoria. In fact, it's going for a prime hard classification in southern New South Wales at the moment. It's, it's quite an elite quality line. Yeah, yeah hey, what, what was the difference between Justica and Ford last year? What was the main driver there? Um, sorry, you were talking about which part, the yield or yeah. the, yeah. Um, hmm. I'm not certain. <laughs> That's the first point. I actually think if you, um, if we looked at our own internal trials, uh, we saw Cord do quite a bit better than Justica and that surprised me a little bit because normally in a uh, high yielding environment, Justica tended to do better in the past. But I think it had a bit to do with, again, that uh, dry period we had in September. Um, Cord really has an adaptation much more like Gladius, Justica more like the Spear family, and I think that that little window that we had of drought stress probably started to favour the Gladius types a little bit more. And I think you saw that more generally in the NVT data, that the Gladius types did better in 2011 compared to 2010, even though the yields were fairly similar. It was just the way that they got there was different, and this comes back to that whole how does a plant make its yield, and every variety does it very differently. You would also notice, sorry, just quickly, that the uh, clear field variety, I just put one up there, was really negative for its, uh, for its profitability. And I think that's an important point. Although we've said, look, these things are a lot better than clear field Jants and STL, we've still got a way to go. And I think we recognise that. You just mentioned what, uh, what the prime hard in southern New South Wales. What's preventing prime hard being available to South Australian growers? Uh, look, I think it's something that's up for debate right now, actually. There's a current review going under classification. There's a whole heap of issues that are, uh, are, are around. There is almost no evidence that there should be any classification boundaries in Australia. There's very little evidence of any routine and reliable GBOE for wheat quality, so that if you can produce 15% protein and a guy up in Queensland can, your wheat should be just as good quality as his, and so why shouldn't you be rewarded for it? And I think that's a very fair question. And a lot of the issues are about creating segregation space, but that shouldn't actually stop a variety being classified. What we could move to, for example, is setting up a class every classification in every zone, or even maybe remo removing zones altogether, and actually saying, this is the classification, but at the end of the day, if the bulk handler doesn't want to set up the segregation, that's their call, right? I mean, if, there if there's enough growers in an area that say, we're all going to grow this prime hard variety, well, then they'll set up the segregation. So uh, history is what is stopping it. And, and I'm hopeful that things will change in the future.